Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about ways that you can think about pursuing your passion. After all, many of us probably have dreams by midlife that we feel that we want to strive and achieve. Perhaps there have been obstacles in the way that we felt, well, maybe this just isn't for me or it wasn't meant to work out. Other reasons could be deep embedded fears that kind of make you believe that maybe you just don't deserve to have what it is that you would like to have in your life. Well, I suppose probably one of the first things to do that we all hear is to face your fears. And that's exactly what our guest joining us here on the program did today. He's someone who's been a Hollywood stuntman who has broken two Guinness Book of World Records, one of them parachuting 45 minutes and having him the hugest bungee jump made from a hot air balloon that was 15,200 feet above Port Atlanta, Spain. He's going to be talking about how you can subtly shift fear-based programming that is subconsciously holding you back by offering practical advice that is a combination of ancient knowledge with state-of-the-art science to accelerate the direction of your dreams. His book is The Fearless Path, What a Movie Stuntman's Spiritual Awakening Can Teach You About Success. Curtis Rivers, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, on your way to coming to this interview this morning, you didn't happen to step on another puff adder, did you? <laughs> Luckily not. No. <laughs> thank goodness for that. You know, when I was reading about that, it was it was funny because I'd actually had a memory of a guest that I had some years ago, who I know, it was his journey in Costa Rica, and that one of the things they were talking about was uh, adders. They ha- actually have a lot of those kind of vipers, apparently, in Costa Rica. And it was interesting that he said that nine out of ten times, if you were bitten by one of those, as deadly as those snakes are, most likely you're going to get what's called a dry bite, in other words, no venom, and explaining the fact is is because they expend a lot of energy actually making the venom, so they'd rather bite something that they're actually going to be able to eat. So I kind of wondered if you had that, you know, maybe it would be a 50-50 shot, but you didn't have to worry about it too much. No, luckily I, I had thick boots on, and I think if anything it must have struck that, so I was very lucky to get away with that one. Now, you actually started with your dream as a stuntman. This goes back to your teens. Tell us how this all started for you. This started for me uh, watching a TV show called The Fall Guy. Uh, ah, I remember that one very, very well. Yeah, me too. So Lee Majors jumping out of the airplane at the start of the movie, the TV show. And I just used to look at that and think, wouldn't that be amazing, you know, to, to, to jump out of an airplane to go skydiving. And as I got into the TV show, wouldn't that be an amazing job? Because I wasn't very good at sports as a child. I wasn't very good at football or soccer or, or rugby. Um, but I, I did like to sort of climb trees and, you know, jump off things into water and, and those kind of things. So I thought, what a marvelous job that would be to be in the movies and to be a stuntman. And, and that stayed with me throughout my life, really. Now, people might look at that and think the same thing where you see, <clears throat> excuse me, the end result. For instance, people see uh, performers who get up and sing, or you might be a race car driver. There's a whole gamut of ways that you can look at the end result and say, I want to do that. But the truth is, there's not only a lot of desire, but also a lot of work that goes into it. And uh, as you were unraveling what it took with the kind of training that you did, you don't just simply go and you learn how to fall out of things, but there's a ton of different kinds of things that a person needs to consider when it comes to preparing yourself for this kind of uh, endeavor. Tell us about some of the things that you that you decided to do when it came to your training. Well, I wrote away to the local Citizens Advice Bureau for information as a 12-year-old. Uh, they very kindly replied, and they hooked me up to the Actors' Union, like the Screen Actors Guild, but the, the British version. And they gave me a long list, and you had to become an actor to start with, and, and I was a shy kid, and the thought of learning to act, that was the first stumbling block. But I also had to be a, a black belt in at least one martial art, hopefully two. I had to become a, a fencing instructor, um, a skydiving display parachutist, the highest level that, that you can get in the world for that qualification, a hang glider pilot, um, a sub aqua paddy dive master, and just dozens of different aspects like learning to ride a horse to the standard needed to go show jumping and to compete. Um, I learned 10 different disciplines up to the equivalent to black belt standard in the end over a seven-year training period. And that was just 
to get me onto a film set to then learn how to be a stuntman on the film set. And then there was a matter of also the next obstacle that you had to face, which was getting your uh, union card, too, and what that entailed. Tell us about that. Well, to get my union card, I had to become a professional actor or perform for money, you know, some kind of a professional performance on a stage. And because I was a fencing instructor at the time, I ended up doing medieval banquets, and I got into fire breathing. I, I had a, a bed of nails act, believe it or not. Uh, and I would do whatever it took just to get that equity card because that was a prerequisite. They wouldn't even consider the application to become a stuntman unless you had that union card as an actor, performer. So, yeah, I traveled around. I did a, a Wild West shootout cowboy show. I did drama school. I, I appeared in a t- television series. I did some theater. You know, anything and everything that was required to get the job done. Well, you know, and it's so true, too, because you uh, hit on something that's so necessary, especially when it comes to goals, especially the really big ones, such as you wanting to become a stuntman. And and congratulations also. I want to let the uh, listeners know that you are in the Hollywood Stuntman Hall of Fame, and I know that's not an easy place to get to. (laughs) But, you know, the fact is, is, you know, as you keep saying, it's being willing to do anything and everything that that is necessary, and, and most of those things you may not like doing, but they also prepare you for the inevitable possibility that when success crosses your path, you're really ready to go. And so I wanted to kind of go back to that fencing uh, that you were talking about. Now, that was one of those situations you not only taught fencing, but you found yourself face-to-face with what you could call the bully challenge. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, so that happened um, on my kind of audition when I was being looked at to see if I was a good enough standard to join this team that did medieval banquet halls, you know, back in the UK. And, you know, there there was the established guy who, you know, played the bad guy for Guy of Gisborne. And he had his nose a little bit pushed out of joint because this new guy had arrived who actually taught these different weapons, saber, you know, and foil and epee up to quite a high standard. Uh, and I used to teach at a, a university campus and, and, and run their team. So, yeah, he, he approached me, this guy, and let's see what you're made of. And, you know, he started to basically whip me with his sword. He, he wasn't doing it very well. <laughs> and, and there's a decision there to, you know, do I respond, you know. And it goes back to that playground bully situation, which I'd learned at a certain age because I was trained to be a stuntman as a child. I learned to do boxing. And I just saw how different the bullies were once you could look after yourself and you didn't back down or turn away or you, or you stood up to them. And, and so that all came flooding back. I was about 23 years old and I quickly started to defend myself and then I would pop the odd you know, little nudge to the ribs with the sword, uh, which no one had done to him before. And the more he lost his cool, the easier it was then to just sort of ease back and just parry and riposte and, and, and pick him off one strike at a time until he, he had to admit defeat. And it kind of put him in his place, but quietly gained a little bit of respect, and it taught him a lesson too, you know. And, and that's actually how I got that job in the, the medieval banquet hall. Yeah, I couldn't help as I was reading that part to remember the scene in uh, the movie Rob Roy. And, uh, you know, here you have this big Scotsman with his big heavy sword, you know, and he's going after, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was uh, Tim Roth. That's and right. Tim Roth sort of had that sort of feminine look to him, and he was all graceful. And he did the same thing that you were talking about there, where he just started taunting this guy and getting this guy frustrated. You can't just hack me down like you're, you know, cleaving away at an ox. You actually have to have grace and skill and speed in this and just wasted this guy, you know, yeah, exactly. and purely by getting him frustrated. That's the one, yeah, absolutely. Now, in your story, The Fearless Path, uh, this is also a journey that, I, if I remember right, that you were on a mountain track on Kilimanjaro with uh, someone by the name of Pierce, and you're kind of unfolding what it is that you uh, also do in life above and beyond being a stuntman, which is to be an inspirational speaker, showing people, you know, sort of the pillars, if you will, of how they can go about uh, looking at uh, believing and achieving their goals. And so now is Pierce someone who was a real person or is this so, sort of someone who's fictional in this case? So well, it's somewhat fictional in that, you know, climbing various mountains and this is a conglomeration of lots of different mentors that I've had on lots of trips and it's condensed 
uh, into a single journey and arranged in the book in such a way where the the reader can read one chapter a day uh, and there's a little lesson to be told at the end of it, something to reflect on, maybe a little exercise. So you know, the ascension of this mountain over seven days you know, matches their own, the reader's journey. And there's lots of um, NLP, neuro linguistic programming um, methods in there in terms of words used in the line spaces to sort of speak gently to the reader's subconscious memory. So the, their mind is soaking up uh, all of this information uh, as well as and practically doing the exercises. So it's arranged in that way, um, just uh, as a good way of recounting, you know, all of this knowledge that I've picked up over, you know, 30 plus years of, of studying this kind of psychology and working for the last 21 years dealing with fear in this way. And as someone who's been a stuntman and probably still is, you still do the work, don't you? I do, yeah. Okay, very well. Yeah, how do you get away from something you love and you're pretty good at? I mean, you're a Hall of Famer for crying out loud. You just don't walk away from that. <laughs> but, you know, I, the I, point I, I is, is, you know, this is a situation you find yourself facing what can be uh, not only dangerous and injurious, perhaps even for life, but also something that could be facing death as well. I mean, you know, when you talk about coming 30,000 feet, you know, or bungee jumping out of a, uh, a hot air balloon, for instance, you just don't know what's going to happen. So you're kind of, as they say, perhaps in horse racing or bullfighting, you're sort of living life on the way up, <laughs> if you will. And so, but most of the time, people in their thinking, when it comes to achieving the big things, whether there's this dream home they want to have, or it's a dream career, even starting a business, they're facing fears that are mostly ghosts and illusions, you know, and so you start right off by talking about meditation and how to just calm that mind and pay attention to your thinking. And I'm sure that in all the seminars you've done, you found that if people can just get over that hurdle, you know, if they can learn how to do something like quiet the mind or pay attention to your thoughts and realize just how much they're like phantoms, as Pierce would describe in the book, just think of them as clouds just passing by on their way to somewhere else. And if you can get to that place where you're beyond that, then the real fun starts to begin, doesn't it? Exactly that. It's very common for people to self-sabotage. And, and you know, the, the different types of fears, I think there's a, a healthy fear in terms of, you know, that old part of our brain, the reptilian part of the brain, that, you know, fight or flight. You mentioned a snake, you know, if you came across a snake or a, a rabid dog ran out in the road towards you, it's quite natural and good that your adrenaline pumps up and you, and you have a, a knee-jerk reaction. That, that, that's a, a good fear. The fear I address in the book is these self-sabotaging fears, that, you know, that you, you want to try a new business or, or change, you know, your career or go for a promotion and you immediately start to think, you know, what, what will the neighbors think if I tell them and I, and I fail and I don't make this? What happens if I join that gym and I don't lose the weight? And I've told too many people they'll think I'm a failure and probably best to, that I don't really need to join the gym after all. And, and we talk ourselves out of it. And I see this time and time again. And, you know, like you say, these are, there's, there are ways of dealing with that. Firstly, acknowledging that that fear isn't real. It's just uh, a, what I call a cognitive dissonance, a, a difference between the programming that's running in your subconscious mind and what you consciously think that you're aware of. You know, they're two different things. You start to think about fitness if you're, if you're not very fit, but your subconscious is running a program, a software, if you like, of being unfit. And that difference between two causes nausea and worry and sleepless nights. And the easiest thing in the world to do is just to go back to what you were doing before, to talk your way out of it. You don't need to do that business. You know, I, I could have lost a lot of money. And, and, and you know, it's a shame because all of those things are uh, there waiting to be done. You can attract them to us, but people just give up at the first hurdle, really. And they don't know that if they do the exercises I've mentioned in this book uh, and be consistent and do that. And it takes about 28 to 30 days, you know, a good month of consistent change on a daily basis, new ways of thinking for that to then become the new programming in the subconscious. And at that point, it gets very, very exciting. Now, uh, through a lot of the work that you've done, especially in studying and, and uh, I guess, integrating what you have learned when it comes to mindset, uh, we talk about the subconscious mind, and I like to liken that to think of your mind, for instance, as a large iceberg floating in the ocean. 
The conscious part is the part that you see above the water line, and the subconscious is the rest of it, which is a pretty huge chunk. So you can see how the subconscious mind literally says, look, little conscious mind, I'm really in control here. And that's where you're talking about getting that conscious mind to integrate that new habit into the subconscious belief. Now, what have you uh, discovered, for instance, is that all about that the mind works that way, besides just simply putting conscious to subconscious? Yeah, so, so, so I noticed um, something uh, a few years ago now. People would ask me, you know, what, what did I do different to other people? For instance, you know, I was the most unlikely stuntman to ever live in terms of I suffered and still do to a degree, you know, from motion sickness. I had a healthy fear of heights. I couldn't swim. When I wanted to be a stuntman at eight, nine years old, I, I couldn't swim properly till I was 13, 14. So I'm the most unlikely stuntman, but that didn't matter because I did things in a certain way. And moving that on to, you know, the conclusion of breaking world records or setting a business up or, or reaching, you know, co- career goals, people would ask, and I didn't really know the answer. And, and so I'd look into that and, you know, talk to different people. And I actually realized one thing I did kind of intuitively, nobody taught me to do this, but I'm, I'm very big on visualization. Uh, always as a child, when I wanted to be a stuntman, my bedroom was full of, you know, a poster of Lee Majors in The Fall Guy or, uh, you know, a, a picture of Evil Knievel doing a jump. And I, I became obsessed by it, which is what I recommend people do in the book to fulfill a goal, you know, become obsessed by it. You know, think of nothing else. Surround yourself with imagery of that thing. And it was only later that I learned that across the board, this, these images that I'd been looking at every day were actually programming my subconscious mind. So you can use that as a technique. And you can introduce affirmations. You can, you know, write positive messages on top of those images. But just, just that alone just puts you so far ahead, just looking at images. And it, not images of how that might be one day, but almost imagined as if it was already happening. Right. So when I jumped out of the hot air balloon to break the world's highest bungee jump record, um, 15,200 feet above the ground, when I actually jumped in my mind, I'd, I'd done that jump 100 times, 200 times. I'd closed my eyes, I'd quietened my mind, and gone through everything, dozens and dozens and dozens of times, until I, I'd looked at every possible eventuality, and I knew it was all going to work and be safe. So that was the first step, really, to digging really deep into this. And that's how um, the subconscious mind soaks up new ideas, is through visualizations, meditative thoughts, uh, and affirmations. Right. And and I like that you talk about a vision board. It's something that I remember doing as a teenager when I was playing basketball. Uh, another point was Saturday Night Fever, believe it or not. I had the Saturday Night Fever posters up. And, and it's pretty amazing when you really lock into something that emotionally you, you're invested in because with that situation, I just remember seeing him on the screen, you know, in his dance solo and realizing that's something I wanted to do. The music was exciting, you know, people watching him do what he did, and I said, I want that for myself, so I worked on it. And you never can know. I mean, I was doing it really for the sheer essence of the fact that I enjoyed it. The next thing, you know, people say, man, I want to see you dance. The next thing, you know, and this is in junior high school. Next thing you know, I'm being called to the principal's office with some guy who was a producer who says, you know, how, would you be interested in choreographing these girls for this thing that I'm doing over at this college over here? And plus, I want you to do a solo as well. And where, where are these coming from? I wasn't soliciting any of these things, certainly, but they just seem to, like, come to you. And I know that you talk about that, too. And I think sometimes people, when they look at goals, especially ones that may be deep inside, they say, I want this. For instance, you were talking about a particular car. Uh, that somebody might say, I'd like to, let's say, have a, a Porsche, for instance. But maybe deep inside there's that doubt or that subconscious feeling that they don't deserve it somehow. And you simply say, look, put it on a vision board. Just kind of look at that. Wonder what that would feel like to be inside. Maybe go to a Porsche dealer, for instance, and sit in one. See if the guy would be willing to let you go for a little test drive so you could feel what that's like to be in it. Don't worry so much about the money or how it comes to you. And in your situation, that particular car you were interested in came to you in a very unexpected way. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I had a, a photograph of the exact make and model and the color. And because uh, you know, it, it's really important to be very specific. You know, you, you can't be vague in these things. You've got to give it a lot of thought and be very, very specific uh, in exactly what you want. So I, I had that photograph above my desk. And having 
gone through this process many, many times. You know, um, it, it's not an arrogance, but it's just a, a, a knowing that that particular thing is on its way to me. And I don't know how yet, and, and it's exciting. I wonder how and when this is going to show up, but it will, because mentally I'd sat in that car, I'd smelt the leather, I'd pressed the buttons, I'd driven it, I'd heard the engine roar. I'd employed all of my senses in that. And then out of the blue, one day, a friend of mine called who was uh, starting to set up a little business. So actually selling cars on eBay. And um, asked me some questions about to do with the uh, Photoshop it was, and whether I could help him, you know, do some of the ads in the listing, and we got chatting. Um, and he basically just mentioned as a matter of fact that, yeah, he's got a couple of cars. He's got this lovely uh, Mercedes, it was a Mercedes E280. Uh, and I smiled and looked up at the photograph and said, oh, really? Okay, Trevor, what, uh, what, what color is that? Oh, oh silver, it's, uh, you know. And I sort of glanced at the picture. What make? And he just described this thing that I was looking at. It had been on my desk a couple of months. Uh, right down to the, to the year, to the finish, to the, to the spec, in terms of the sat nav and all the electric goodies and things in there. And he described it to a T. And I kind of smiled and said, hmm, let's see, I might take that off you. And, uh, and that was it. I was driving around in the car a few days later, taking off uh, the wall, that photograph, and putting into an album of things that I'd uh, conjured up, if you like, and little keep a record of all those things that I didn't used to have uh, experienced and enjoyed. I know when you were talking about a vision board earlier, uh, one person I like to, to bring up in that particular situation would be uh, LeBron James. And there's a wonderful documentary out there that's actually about a basketball team he played on back in high school that was considered to be probably the greatest basketball team of all time in high school. And so they go to each of the players that were on this team. They had stayed together for years. So it just made them an incredible team. So they focused on their life, who they were, how they got interested in basketball. And the, and the documentary is called More Than a Game. But when they got to LeBron James, so you're in this little apartment in this little room that was his bedroom. He says, right over there is my Michael Jordan wall. This is my Kobe Bryant wall, and this and this and this. And here's a guy that has been to more NBA finals consecutively than any other player in history. And he's just, we already know phenomenally where this guy is at. But you can see having that kind of a vision board on three or four walls of these players, how this guy every night you know, would go to bed or sit in his room and, and do his drills and do those things necessary to prepare himself to be where he wants to be. And that there is the journey. You were mentioning earlier, for instance, people who are interested in being in better shape or losing weight, going to the gym. How often do people actually unrealistically look at the end result and overlook the little steps or the journey that it takes to get there? Yeah, uh, it, it's a mixture of, uh, I find, of, you know, and, and it, there's no unrealistic expectation. Um, if it's a really big leap, you know, that, that they're going to lose, you know, three stone and weight, um, you know, it's a, a fear aspect, that little nagging doubt of, you know, you know, maybe this won't happen. And a good analogy really is, is in terms of my stunt training. I, I needed to go out and, and get these 10 skills. Uh, I didn't uh, go and do it all at the same time. They were all broken down into, well, I'll, I'll start doing judo first, and then maybe I can learn trampolining at this stage. And so it was broken down into baby steps. And then when you, if you take just one of those, like judo, that is then broken down into you know, nine or ten belts. And you just start as a white belt, and you think of nothing else but the yellow belt. You ignore all of that major journey ahead of you, and you just, all that's important is that you get to the yellow belt. And you look at your criteria, the throws you have to learn, the holds, and just obsess about that. And again, you know, I'd vision boards and things like that, images of judo throws and my homework and Japanese pronunciations. And you just focus on that. And then the second you get that yellow belt, you know, pat yourself on the back for a day. And now it's time to look at the orange belt. And when you break it down into baby steps like that, before you know it, you know, a year later, you're halfway towards your goal already. And done five belts and you know and it's the same with things like that um, you know breaking it down into baby steps and smaller goals but also some people make a, a key mistake early days and they tend to think upside down they'll think about the weight they want to lose you know I'm fat I don't want to be fat and too much weight and there's a negative connotation to that 
So the subconscious brain is, is just hearing the word fat, and it's hearing weight and dis-ease and being unhealthy. So just a simple exercise to be conscious of what we're saying to our subconscious mind and changing that. You, know, you can mean the same thing, but say something like, I can't wait to be slim. I'm looking forward to being healthy. And, and that way, slowly but surely, on a daily basis, you start to saturate your subconscious mind with thoughts of being slim and, and healthy and you know, energetic. And, and it makes a massive, massive difference. You, you know, all your demons go away. And like I say, if you sustain that for 30 days, then it's you know, all downhill and quite easy uh, after that. Yeah, and it's so important, too, that you really look at the journey itself because that's where the real magic also begins as well. The end result or the goal is just a way for you to decide I'm traveling in this direction. Correct? It's exactly that, you know. And the truth is, you know, it never ends, does it, you know. I uh, you know, broke my first world record and you know, after celebrating and checking, we got the footage and it was all good. I'm immediately thinking, well, you know, if, uh, we did say we could attack this uh, bungee jump record, you know, what are the weather patterns like, and I'm immediately moving on to the next one. Uh, and some people don't understand that, you know, what's the matter, you've been training for this for years, you know, can you just uh, sit back and enjoy it? And Oh, yeah, you know, I'm enjoying it, but uh, I'm just looking forward to what else we can do. We've got the hot air balloon, we've got all this equipment, I've got a sponsor, and, you know, so it is about the, the journey and all of the you know, excitement you have in that. And Sometimes we miss it, of course, and you know, there's a chapter there uh, you know, about gratitude, and, and, and I mentioned gratitude is, is one of those seven pillars. Uh, and it really is important to just stop for a moment during the journey, you know, take a deep breath and just look around you and, and be grateful and, and, and just notice what you actually have now. Because you know, many times, and this is very common amongst actors I know and, and other stuntmen, is at the time when we were training to be stuntmen, we just couldn't wait to qualify, and we'd we'd watch a, a big movie, Indiana Jones, or a Bond movie, and like that, that's going to be us one day, and we couldn't wait. But once we actually qualified and got into the movies, realised how much we enjoyed that journey, and was great, everything was new, you know, learning to ride a horse for the first time, and expert in that, and all the different things that you uh, you, you learned. It was a heck of a, a journey, and. Oftentimes we we don't appreciate it as it's happening. So it is good to have a goal set and, and, and know exactly where we're going. But it's also good on a daily basis to just stop and uh, and look around and be grateful too. I couldn't agree with you more. And I was thinking about something also as I was realizing that you uh, and I think I actually remember when you did both of those world record breakers. I was thinking thirty thousand feet. People can actually jump from that high. <laughs> That's way up there. <laughs> But the first thing uh, that came to mind, too, is, and it always automatically comes to mind when I think of somebody who's jumping from a height, as I, one of my favorite all-time Burt Reynolds movies, which is Hooper. You familiar with that one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I would hope you would be. You're a stuntman. Anyway, for those out there, Hooper is about Hollywood stuntmen, and it's about making a movie but from the stuntman's perspective. And in that one at the time, and this was the 1970s, is that then was also the highest free-falling uh, jump, I guess, whether it was in a movie or in general. And I wondered, when you decided to do this this jump that you had did, skydiving, what was the goal that was already there that you were looking at? What moved you in that direction? Um, it was it was a mixture. I do remember that film. That was, that was uh, you know, very inspirational to me at the time. And I must have watched that a hundred times, Hooper. You know, Especially the Jan Michael Vincent scene where they leap over the canyon. Can't ever get over that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. That. A stuntman called A.J. Barakas did the, did the fall from the helicopter doubling for Burt Reynolds. And he sadly passed away trying to break his, his own world record a few months later for a movie called Steel. Um, but the, the, the whole thing about the parachuting record, that, that came about because in a similar way to what I said earlier about achieving the goal and then looking for the next step. And in, in skydiving, you know, the, the method that I used, quite an old-fashioned method of a static line which pulls the parachute as you jump out and you build up to doing free falls. And basically, you start at 2,000 feet and, and you do various exercises and then you start jumping at three and four and a half and it gets higher and higher 
uh, and you get longer and longer in free fall to do different exercises with an instructor. But in England, that stops at 12,000 feet. So then I went to Lake Wales in Florida because they went to 14,000 feet at this particular drop zone. And, and then that was the, you know, the end of that. And I thought, mm, it would be great to just fall further. Uh, and then I went to Paris Valley in California, uh, different skydiving, 16,000 feet. It was great, you know, a long, long time in free fall. And you get to that point where you're at saturation. To go any higher, you require oxygen. And that's a whole new ball game. That's, that's the uh, Navy SEALs or the SAS in the UK or you know, Special Forces. And But I just really wanted to do that. So I started to look into, well, well how would I do that? You know, So I did the training with the military. Uh, I learned to do jumps on oxygen. And I had to go to Spain to do a lot of it. I wasn't allowed to do it in the UK. Uh, and I just started going higher and higher. But then that led to thinking, wouldn't it be even better if I could jump and open my parachute high uh, and be flying a parachute effectively at the same height as a jumbo jet, you know, in minus 40 degrees and no oxygen, but I'd have the system on and a thermal wear on. And, uh, and that's exactly what I did in the end. The world record had existed for some, you know, about 40 to 50 years, uh, I, think, I think similar, 47 years, I think, when I, when I broke it. And that had been a 40-minute uh, parachute jump where the parachutist um, had got caught in thermals and, uh, over the desert in the States. And you know, I managed to fly a parachute for 45 minutes. So, you know, jumped out 30,000 feet, popped the canopy open and, and flew it, much like a hang glider, over these mountains in Spain. And uh, touched down after 45 minutes. Absolutely fantastic. So what's next for you? I mean, here's something we didn't mention. So you fulfilled a life goal of becoming a Hollywood stuntman. I would have to say the, the, what do we want to call that, the extras about that whole thing were that you were in the, you know, the Hollywood Stuntman Hall of Fame. I'm certain that wasn't a goal of yours, but that's sort of like a byproduct, if you will. Uh, but the biggest one, and I think you could actually teach classes, I'm certain Evil Knievel would have been interested in this, is you never broke a bone. <laughs> How did you manage that one? <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff he was doing was a little bit silly. In fact, just nuts. But <laughs> you know, but that's just the life of being somebody who does that kind of work. Sure. It it, it sounds counterintuitive, but um, you would assume every single stuntman is a daredevil. But uh, I'm not really a daredevil in that in that sense. You know, you, you realize very quickly that you can't be. So I'm I'm very methodical. I I rehearse and rehearse and I keep looking and looking and I'm. As we rehearse, I'm looking for, is there something I've overlooked? Is there anything that could go wrong here? What could, what if this, what if that? And I'm just ultra, ultra cautious. So I, I do the stunt, it goes well, but if I can get padding on, I'll put the padding on. If we can, especially nowadays with CGI, where we can paint out ropes and, 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 and wires. You know, if you can paint it out, why not put two wires on it? be totally safe, you know? We're human beings, we break if we fall. And so I'm just ultra cautious. And I, again, I, I use the same technique that I discuss in the book uh, in, in my career in terms of visualization. Um, but there's a lot of uh, you know, similarities you know, in terms of actors and stuntmen in terms of we, we do visualize it way ahead of arriving on the set. We've done that for, we think about it a lot, and then we turn up and then you know, we look in situ, then we start to mentally rehearse whilst looking at an airbag from the top of a building. And then we'll do tests and we'll drop things down into that and, and assess the wind and then we'll jump from a lower height. And, you know, it, it, it's breaking it down again into, into smaller chunks and building up to that big stunt. So by the time I would jump off a building, then I've mentally done it dozens and dozens of times and I've actually physically rehearsed that a number of times. So that, um, you know, I'm 99.99% certain it's going to be absolutely fine. And so far, knock on wood, it has been. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly I appreciate <clears throat> that you describe it in that way because you're keying on something that we talked about earlier in the program. It's preparing yourself for when success comes. You know, you don't just sit back and you do a little bit, hope that it shows up. You prepare, you prepare, you prepare. I mean, you prepare, as uh, Harvey McKay would say, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. That way you're prepared when that time comes and so you're not just a daredevil rushing in and hoping it all works out but you're actually planning for it to work out and Anthony Robbins also talks about the very same thing immerse yourself in it take care of the baby steps until they become habits and before you know it there it is in front of you 
and it'll, and it'll still amaze you even when you're going in that direction in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And that's what makes the whole thing very exciting, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's definitely that, you know, and it never ceases to become exciting. And even though you, you, you're very, very confident that what you're working on will come to fruition, it never takes it away when it when it comes about. And, you know, it, it still makes you smile at how it all works, you know, the power of it, really. Not to mention the training, and we'll let uh, listeners, when they pick up your book, The Fearless Path, read this for themselves, but how you were able to deal with a pretty big unexpected stunt, which was up in Kilimanjaro, that happened to de- deal with a, a whiteout that you dealt with, with Pierce. But we'll let them read about that later. <laughs> the book is The Fearless Path, what a movie stuntman's spiritual awakening can teach you about success. I'd like to thank Curtis Rivers for joining us here on the program. Uh, Curtis, before you leave, is there a website, a place people can find out how to get your book and where you're doing talks, seminars, things like that? Yeah, sure. It, uh, you can go to www.curtisrivers.com, and it's all on there, all the links to social media and the book and anything you might like to know. I'd love to hear from people. Very good, and I know I was on your Google Plus page, and there's a lot of great information there and, and little tools as well, so you might want to also consider that, and that's curtisrivers.com, and your Google Plus would be Curtis Rivers, I would guess. Yeah, I mean, it, com- completely honest, I haven't been doing that uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I looked on there, and there was some great stuff anyway. <laughs> I mean, how who could ever keep up with social media every day, right? Exactly. I mean, you're too busy doing stunts. <laughs> well, Curtis, thank you so much for joining us on the program today and sharing your life story with us and what people can do to achieve their dreams, realizing that it's truly always about the journey. Thank you for being on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. One habit you can also get into is join us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. Halfway.